Well, I think we can start. We have enough people in our global center. Well, hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mateus Coutinho. I'm from FTC, Fundação Dom Cabral, a business for those who, who don't know a business school, a Brazilian business school that considered the seventh best um, in the world, according to the British uh, newspaper Financial Times. And we are here today uh, in our global seminar called uh, Leadership in the New Geopolitical Order, uh, China and Brazil, Challenges and Opportunities. With uh, This is an event in partnership with Zeeves, uh, a business school from China. And we have, we have here representatives from both institutions and um, uh, as well as professors. And I invite here to, to start uh, Viviane Barreto, Associate Dean for Global Strategy and International Affairs at FDC. Thank you. Hi, hello everyone. Hi, good morning, good evening. Thank you for being with us. Um, this is a very special moment for FDC and for ZIBS. And uh, this is a, uh, a result of the partnership between FDC and ZIBS. And we, as, as an important asset of this partnership, is to have together the team and students and people from FDC and uh, Zeeb's environment. So we can get to know each other, we can get to know our teams, our professors, and get to know a little bit more of the best of each one of the schools. So to, for, for today, for this evening, we'll have the chance to have Professor Rodrigo Zeidão, I'll let him introduce himself, and Patricio, Professor Patricio Giusto from Azibs. I'll let him introduce himself as well. Uh, and we'll be discussing about leadership in the new geopolitical order, China and Brazil challenges and opportunities. And more than only a speech, the idea is to create a space of a dialogue here. And I also would like to thank a lot Rodrigo Moura for actually leading uh, the effort to build this partnership with FDC. I hope you have a great time here and looking forward to interact with you in this session. Thank you very much. Before uh, I get over to Professor Rodrigo Zaidan and our uh, Professor Patricio, um, well, sorry for that. I am a little bit late for the connection. I had a problem, a technical problem here, but here I am. So I am Daniel Parreiras. I'm working together with Viviani and Mateus uh, at the team um, of International Affairs and Global Strategy at FDC. And I am very happy with this project. Uh, this is what we call the Global Seminars, and we are doing our first edition this um, February, the 20th of February uh, 2024. And this just like uh, just reinforcing what Viviani brings, uh, the project uh, has the reason to be uh, connecting students, knowledge, schools, and people around the world. Uh, and we are starting with a very hot topic, uh, the relations, the commercial relations, the, the geopolitical relations between China, Brazil, and of course, all the connections with, with, the, with the world. This is, I think, uh, Professor Rodrigo Zaidan and Patricio, this is time to discuss that. Every time it's time to discuss that. But more than that, uh, yesterday, I was uh, taking a look at the numbers of the agribusiness sector in Brazil. It's impressive and massive and make me think, well, my goodness, that's uh, a lot of people in the world to feed and there is a lot of uh, to produce. But how we are doing that? Uh, in, in what kind of conditions and how the marketing is, is reacting? And how the geopolitical and commercial game around the world are are, are playing that and facing the issues that uh, come up with uh, all of those. A lot of people, a lot of generations, a lot of people to be fed and so on. So this is just like a little, little, little thing. I know that things could be even bigger when you think about um, economics, polit politics and so on. But this is just to, to make the, the debate, uh, to start the debate. Uh, but anyway, I'm very happy to see here my colleague Rodrigo Zaidan that we, we, we work together in so many uh, learning journeys and programs in Brazil and abroad. Uh, Rodrigo, is today you are in China, right, Zaidan? Correct. I, I speak from the future. 
It's there 7 you go. p.m. here. There you go. Speaking straight from the future. Amazing. Uh, and Rodrigo Moura, which is amazing. We were together here in Brazil uh, a couple of months ago. So it's, I'm very happy to, to see you here again. Well, anyway, uh, over to you, professors. Um, it would be lovely to be here around and to maybe put some questions or organize the debate if the audience come up with some, uh, some interaction. So thank you so much. So who should I speak first, Daniel? Please, uh, your microphone is open, so okay. be my guest. Let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Zaidan. I'm Brazilian, even though I'm speaking English. I'll try not to speak with my Carioca accent. Uh, that would be a little bit weird. Um, but um, I right now I'm in China, I'm in Shanghai. Um, I've been uh, teaching at New York University, uh, Shanghai. Right. Um, why? Why is my computer asking me what is my speaking language? Um, but anyway, um, I've been at Fundação do Cabral since 2011, in one way or, or the other. So it's a pleasure to to see everybody here. Um, I will actually start with a question for Patricio, um, which is, how does the decoupling between China and the U.S. affect Latin America? And what should we expect of this decoupling? Because I have, I'm an economist, right? So I will bring um, an economics point of view. But Patricio is an expert in geopolitics and he's able to give us uh, uh, a broader context about what is going on in the world. Um, just so you, so you understand a little bit what we're talking about, China is the, is the largest Brazilian uh, trade partner, is larger than the US, is larger than Europe. Brazil is one of the few countries that has a huge trade surplus with China. And here's the thing that people don't understand. Uh, we overestimate China in the short run. We underestimate China in the long run. What do I mean by this? Everybody talks about China, the 40 years of growth and stuff like this. Uh, today, China, the Chinese economy is the same size as the American economy. However, uh, GDP per capita or any other measure that you want for the Chinese economy, uh, like productivity, is around 20% of the US, which means that the average Chinese worker produces 20% of what the average American worker produces. And with this 20%, China is already the same size as the, as the United States in terms of, of the size of the economy. We are not prepared for a world in which China continues to grow unimpeded for the next 10 years. China already consumes 70% of, of idle war, much of that from Brazil. Uh, so of course, it may be that China doesn't continue growing like it, was, like it has been doing in the past. However, the importance of China for Brazil cannot be understated. And again, I'm not talking about the present. I'm talking about the future, especially because as China and the US decouple, because Brazil is a neutral country, Brazil can trade with both. And that is an asset. And that, that will have a huge impact uh, in the Brazilian economy. But before I continue, of course, I wanna, I wanna, uh, uh, I wanna pass the baton to our guests. Patricio Justo, uh, who I'm going to have the pleasure to meet in, in, in China uh, next semester. Patricio, please introduce yourself and, and tackle whatever small problem we have in the geopolitics of the world today. Well, thank you so much, Rodrigo. And I take two good points from you that I want to come back later after my brief introduction. You mentioned decoupling. Well, let's discuss about that. I think it's very interesting. And I may have heard you saying maybe Brazil in a neutral position. Is that okay? I heard you well. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. That's another thing I think uh, very interesting to, to discuss later. Well, but good morning to everyone. I am in Argentina. It, it is a real honor for me to take part in, in this conversation with all of you sharing the floor with, 
Rodrigo Saidan, and I really respect uh, and admire the work and prestige of FDC. So thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo Moura, for, for this invitation. I, I hope we can have a great discussion. Um, I am a university professor of international relations and also political consultant uh, here in Argentina. I work both for public and, and private sector, specialized in Chinese foreign policy. And I'm currently working, uh, conducting research uh, about US-China relations for my PhD thesis project. Uh, before we move into, uh, we move on with the questions, these good points from Rodrigo and questions from the audience and maybe the moderator also, I would like to share with you like five general ideas, like opening remarks uh, before we, we move on with the discussion. I think first of all, 2024 is expected to be a very complicated year for the world for various reasons. Basically, due to the expansion of wars and conflicts in different parts of the, of the planet, being the most concerning, as you know, this unpredictable situation that is unfolding in the Middle East, I think the, the outcome of this escalation will have severe economic consequences, further aggravating some pre-existing negative global trends and of course, we have the situation in Ukraine and other issues that, that you might be well aware of. It is hard to be optimistic. This is the first idea I would like to share with you. It is hard to be optimistic in front of this uh, scenario. Moreover, considering what, what, I, what I believe there are clear signs of global global leadership deficit. This is something something else that we can discuss later. Second, as you know, also China's economy is suffering from several structural problems, such as an increasingly uh, aging population, prolonged real estate crisis, record high youth unemployment, plunging stock stock markets. The stock markets they are recovering. Uh, they have been recovering during these past two weeks, but the trend is uncertain of what might happen in the future with this. We have also weak economic, uh, weak, uh, sorry, weak uh, domestic consumption with deflation. This is something really concerning for Chinese authorities. Factory activity in decline and financial stress at local government. So it's a very complex situation with a lot of factors, as you see in play. Um, and we are, we are in front of a very um, complicated economic situation in China. President Xi uh, has publicly acknowledged this, uh, that the Chinese economy is in trouble and started to take measures uh, in that regard. But the timeline of, timeline of this recovery, as well as, as the effectiveness of these measures are still uncertain, I would say. There is consensus that business confidence is also at one of the lowest points since she took, po uh, took power back in 2013. Just to, to quote um, one figure, FDI in China fell to a 30-year low in 2023. Third, I will say China's uh, relation with the U.S. This is related to one of the things that Rodrigo mentioned. China's relations with the U.S. might be entering a new phase of stabilization because of mutual needs, not because of uh, ideological alignment or political alignment. This is because of mutual needs, because of this complicated context, mostly. With more fluent, we are seeing more fluent and frequent interactions, but critical issues as Taiwan and the South China Sea could still spike uh, high tensions, I think, during this new year. And to make matters worse, uh, the highly likely victory of Donald Trump in the upcoming US election, I think, anticipates more uncertainty and concern over the future of the bilateral relations. And we could also say concern about the U.S. relations with the entire war. And Brazil is also in the picture of that uh, worrying new situation that may, uh, may present to us if Trump wins, as is 
expected, as I said. Fourth, I think China and Latin America relations are at the turning point now with significant changes in Beijing's uh, foreign policy and priorities toward the regions. If you look, if we, if we look at trade, maybe we don't, we wouldn't realize of these changes. I think the change the these changes are in other areas. For example, in recent years, uh, relations have continued to prosper in trade, especially because of China's great demand of raw materials and food, basically, and also energy. And for sure, trade will continue to be one of the most important pillars of, of our relations with China in the years to come. Certainly, this is good news for a country like Brazil, a major um, agricultural uh, producer. But at the same time, the relations between China and our region are showing significant changes, setbacks in other areas, such as investment and finance. There is a changing environment. So we have to uh, pay attention to this and to make the, the proper the, the business decisions. We, we need to understand uh, really what is happening here. And of course, we can also discuss more in detail later. There is a sharp decline in the Chinese investment in Latin America. We have now smaller deals projects more focus on the specific strategic uh, what it, this is what China calls new infrastructure which is more related to technological innovation this is very interesting but challenging and not every country in the region is well prepared to take advantage of this uh, scenario and finally uh, despite these before mentioned trends, you might see most of them negative. I see a very good prospect for the deepening of China-Brazil relations. There are important geopolitical interests shared in the current global context by China and Brazil. There is great political understanding as well between Xi and Lula after the complicated years of Bolsonaro. And there are broad mutual economic needs and share, uh, shared by both countries related to food and energy security. I, I will stress these two areas, but there are others for sure. And finally, now we have, coming from my country, from Argentina, this Millet factor, you know, that I think will bring China and Brazil even closer in the following years. Well, thanks uh, for your attention in this, uh, for this uh, opening ideas and, of course, I'm lo really looking forward to starting our conversation. Well, a lot. Uh, there you go. My my microphone's open. Well, a lot to discuss. I think so, uh, and I can see here that Patricio brings some some topics, and Zaidan brings some topics that it seems like. Uh, uh, points to to be discussed and in the same direction and I think there is some points at the other hand that points not um in another direction but uh points in terms that I know that Rodrigo Zaida will have maybe like different perspectives or uh bring um uh new things to to be discussed uh what what do you think, Zaida, in terms of uh this new revolution in terms of um position from the Brazilian government and the, the Chinese government? And always when we say, Oh, I am here speaking from the future, uh, how do you think this future will be the line, uh, will be um uh, uh, um constructed by us in terms of politics, in terms of demand uh, be in between the countries and, of course, or the whole world and, and, and everything. Um, more than that, uh, I think this is topics that uh, I would like you guys to, to, to discover. But I would love to hear um, our colleague from Zips, uh, Rodrigo. I don't know if Rodrigo would like to give some words and uh, uh, introduce yourself and maybe... Uh, bring some questions from the debate. Rodrigo is our colleague from Zips, uh, our partner school in China, and is here online with us. Yes, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. 
Yep. Uh, it's a gr great pleasure to be here. I'm Rodrigo Moura from ZIPS, uh, Latin America Center. Uh, it's a center inside of uh, Zhejiang University. So we, what we do here, we strongly promote a good relationship between China and Latin America. And uh, we are ready to welcome all of you uh, to our international campus. And here we offer uh, all our courses are in English in various areas of knowledge, such as a uh, master degree in Chinese studies, management, uh, communication, and finance. So I ask you please to follow and visit our website that is zips.zgu.edu.cn. I will share with you in the uh, chat. And later, if you have any questions about the school, you can contact me directly. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, FDC, our partners, uh, Professor uh, Rodrigo Zaidan, Professor Patricio Just. Thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you a lot, Rodrigo. Thank you. Um, let me let me tackle some some issues that uh, Patricio has um, has uh, brought forward. Uh, again, uh, feel free to write anything in the chat. Any question that you might have. Uh, if if writing in, writing in English is not that easy for you, just use a Google Translate. Again, uh, there is no shame in that. That's how I, I uh, talk to people here in China. Given that my Chinese is is mama hu is not very good. Um, so let me expand on on some of the points, especially uh, the lack of Chinese investment in Latin America. It's funny because I was. Um, I don't know if, if everybody here knows Ducati, who is a, which is a motorcycle brand. They are from the same group as Lamborghini and things like that. So I was speaking to the CEO of, of Ducati, and 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 one of their main concern is is the fact that a few years ago, uh, Chinese companies were buying uh, European brands like Volvo and and many other large brands, Pirelli, in Italy. Um, and we had the same concern in Brazil and Latin America that the Chinese are coming and they're, the Chinese are going to buy everything. And I don't know if you noticed, uh, but we have stopped talking about it, right? Uh, a little bit. And there is a reason for that. The Chinese are not coming. Um, and the reason is uh, up until 2015, 16, uh, China was trying to internationalize the U.N. And to internationalize the U.N., they had to open uh, their capital accounts. What people don't know about China is that China has capital controls. For those of you of a certain age in Brazil, it's very easy to understand because Brazil used to have the same type of controls. You cannot send money abroad easily. For people... It's $50,000 a year. But companies, they have, like Brazil in the 80s, they have to apply for a license to buy foreign currency, right? And up until 2016, the, the Chinese, the central bank was relaxing these rules. And that's the, 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 the time that Chinese companies were buying everything abroad. Uh, you can trace all the major purchases from Chinese companies through this period. Why? I explained that in an article uh, for uh, international for international media. But the fact, and, and I'm going to make it simple, is that the Chinese state-owned companies attacked the Central Bank of China by taking dollars out of China, betting that the People's Bank of China was going to were going to be forced to devalue the yuan. And they won. What does it mean that they won? It means that the, the People's Bank of China and the Chinese government, they decided to change the currency regime in 2016-17. And they reintroduce very strict capital controls. Uh, for instance, I have students that intern 
in state-owned companies in China, and their their job is to fill paperwork so importers can buy foreign currency to pay for their imports. And they have to be very precise because otherwise they are going to be denied. Brazil doesn't have that anymore. Brazilians can send money abroad. You can Brazilians can use their credit card abroad, not a problem, right? We don't have capital controls anymore in Brazil. The real is not fully convertible, but that is another uh, thing. So what happened is that since then, the People's Bank of China has reintroduced capital controls. At the same time, allow the yuan to fluctuate much more than in the past. What is the result? Chinese companies cannot invest abroad like they could in the past. It's, it's not that they don't want to come to Latin America or they want to come to Latin America. It's that they cannot invest like in the past. BYD to set up their, their factory in Bahia, they have to ask for authorization to send money abroad. So the Chinese companies are not going to invest in Latin America like people were predicting in the past. That's why, as Patricio mentioned, a lot of the projects are infrastructure projects. Why? Because they are loans. So the idea is no different than what Benny de Assi used to do with uh, Brazilian um, real estate companies, Odebrecht and all those companies that everybody knows from uh, uh, the, the, the scandals in Brazil in the last 10 years. Uh, the Chinese government will lend money for countries such as Argentina, Brazil, to build infrastructure projects with Chinese companies. Why? Because it's a way to neutralize exit of foreign currency from China. To give an idea, in 2016-17, uh, so no, to give an idea, in 2014, Chinese foreign reserves reached $4 trillion. Can you imagine this? $4 trillion of reserves. At the time, people were talking about the US, that China owning most of the US debt. And it reached 30%, if I'm not mistaken. When the state-owned companies attacked the People's Bank of China to maintain the peg of the yuan, the People's Bank of China sold $1 trillion of reserves. And today, the, the, the foreign reserves of China are exactly the same as they were in 2017, $3 trillion. In other words, even though China run a, a huge trade surplus, it has a huge deficit in the balance of services. And that means that it doesn't want to either buy or sell foreign currency to the extent that they did in the past. So the easy money, the easy money from Chinese, Chinese companies, the easy money days from Chinese companies is over. Chinese companies today, when they go abroad, they go abroad like any other company, they go abroad to make money. And those of you who deal with Chinese companies know this. They are very aggressive commercially, and that's what they want. The only, for instance, the Belt and Road Initiative that used to be, in fact, the Belt and Road Initiative was created in 2013 when China was, when Chinese reserves were increasing by $100 billion a month. And the Belt and Road Initiative was created to expel dollars from China because China couldn't get enough dollars. At the time, China was getting too many dollars and the Chinese government is like, what is going to happen? We're going to own the whole debt of the world. Like, they don't want that. And they use the Belt and Road Initiative to foster some geopolitical initiatives around the world. What happened is that after 2017, the Belt and Road Initiative pretty much died. Today, the Belt and Road Initiative is exactly what, as Patricia mentioned, is a way for China to give demand for Chinese infrastructure companies. They are very good. 
Chinese companies are good at building infrastructure. So you want to build infrastructure, here is some money, build infrastructure with a Chinese company, and they pay us back. So there are no more grants. You can only borrow. And you borrow for projects, as Patricio mentioned. You don't borrow as you could in the past for whatever. You're not going to get any, an easy Chinese partner like in the past. Those days are over. However, it all depends on what is going to happen to the Chinese economy in the next few years. And that's what people don't understand, is that the Chinese economy, it still has a lot of space to grow. As Patricio mentioned, there are a lot of headwinds against the Chinese economy. But I really don't care about them, right? Because my point is very simple. And let me make my point to you, which is, is that is a very binary scenario. Either China will get stuck in the middle income trap. For those of you who don't know, the middle income trap is a situation in which a country can uh, go from being poor to being middle income, and then it gets stuck there. That is a country stuck in the middle income trap. You might have heard of this country. It's called Brazil, right? There is another country stuck in the middle income trap that Patricio might have heard, which is called Argentina, right? These countries uh, were able to jump from poverty to middle income. Argentina even became rich, which is really strange because once you're rich, it's really hard to become middle income again. Then again, in Latin America, we can do everything. Venezuela, Argentina, we are very good at, at destroying value. Um, so if, if China gets stuck in the middle income trap because of Xi Jinping and, and the headwinds, then the Chinese economy will just stop growing in the, in, in the way that it was growing in the past. Or China will take the trajectory of South Korea and Japan and it's going to become a technological powerhouse with a scale that we've never seen before. Those are the only two scenarios. There is no third scenario. There is no situation in which China becomes rich but becomes like Portugal. That scenario does not exist. Either China becomes stuck in the middle income trap or China becomes a rich economy and we are not prepared for that. Again, uh, today, China consumes 70% of the iron ore in the world. And China is a middle-income country. What is going to happen when China becomes a rich country? Again, people don't understand this, but there are 400 million people living in rural areas in China that are still to urbanize. I will continue talking about this, but before I talk about this, um, I'm going to pass the, 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 the mic to Patricio to see how he jumps uh, from the points that I made to his very interesting points about geopolitics, because I, I'm looking forward to, to learning from him, given that as an economist, economists, shouldn't, shouldn't, economists are not good at geopolitics, right? So Patricio, the boy is in your court. Well, thank you. Really interesting your the, the points you the points you you've made, and I agree with most of it, especially your characterization of the the situation of the Chinese economy and the possible scenarios we have uh, in front of us. Let's hope that China becomes a, a major technological powerhouse because that will be. Uh, I think the best for the uh, for the world and for countries like Brazil that we have a lot of things to sell. I have mentioned food and energy, but Brazil again, again, I think has a, a huge opportunity to benefit from all these new kind of loans, more uh, maybe very different from those from the past, these huge kind of loans that you could use for uh, almost for anything. And most of, of Latin American governments use them to, to do politics. And, and it was a, a waste, wasted opportunity for, for the region. Of course, there are countries that took advantage of them. But in the case of Argentina, for example, I think we had a bad example 
we were one of the bad apples in, in, in this regard, unfortunately. But these new kind of loans, for example, to develop uh, artificial intelligence hubs, this is like the science fiction for many of the countries in, in our region, but the opportunity is there. I think a country like Brazil has several advantage, advantages, big economy, good uh, human resources, good infrastructure already, or at least better in comparison with other countries in, in the region. But I think the, the opportunity is there to be seized if the, 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 the governments and, and in a federal, a federal country like Brazil, also state government, at the state government levels, it is very important what the one uh, to read uh, correctly this situation and, and to make the, the right decisions. Devoid of ideological considerations, you know, we've seen during the Bolsonaro era, era this was a problem. I think Lula wants to, wants to be pragmatic, is trying to uh, make like a new start in the relation with the, the trip, uh, last year's trip to Beijing. I think it was really, really important, uh, setting like a new tone in the future of the relations. And as I have mentioned also, all this geopolitical context, context helps to get uh, China and Brazil even closer. We have the BRICS, we have the G20. We also have to consider all these multilateral areas where Brazil and China are mostly aligned in their ideas and their objectives of what the world needs. So I, I think this is this is really important and puts Brazil in a in a very unique position in this context. But we should also mention that we we are seeing, of course, you are the Brazilians, you you are the more qualified voices to 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 account for this. But I see Lula trying to position Brazil in. A, some kind of a global or at least regional regional leadership, like trying to seek some uh, new role of Brazil in the world. And it's not been an easy task, let's say, and, and Lula is um, presenting some controversial stances, as you may have seen in the news, for example, regarding what is happening in Ukraine, what is happening in the Gaza Strip, this uh, this new tension with Israel, Brazil recalling the ambassador. So I think Lula is uh, somehow overreacting in, 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 in some areas. For example, Brazil is talking about genocide, you know, in, in what is happening in, in, in the Gaza Strip. Not even China is putting the situation in those wars. So clearly Lula wants to stand, to step up, and to stand out in in the in the rich, in the in the global stage, but that will also bring some trouble because, of course, you can imagine it's uh, naturally this is infuriating for the U.S. and this will complicate the relations uh, with the, between Brazil and the U.S. and this is negative for Brazil's geopolitical and economic interests. So, I think. Lula is is still uh, in trouble trying to establish this balance Brazil will need between China and and the U.S. But coming back to to these opportunities uh, I have mentioned, this these new opportunities are there. I think this uh, this a good it's, it's a good prospect for a country like Brazil. The agro business sector of Brazil is highly competitive. Of course, there are some sectors that, like corn, for example, that Brazil has some trouble in competitiveness, and, and and there are some issues about this currency currency issues that Rodrigo had mentioned. But Brazil has a huge potential to sell even more. There's a huge trace trade surplus already with China, but it's a huge potential to sell even more food energy. Of course, you mentioned Rodrigo Iron Ore. Uh, Brazil is the major iron ore provider of China, and this will continue to be like that in the in the coming years. This this is a solid trend. So 
We don't even have that in, in Argentina. We have a $10 billion trade deficit and we cannot overcome that situation. You may say, how is that possible? You sell soybeans, you sell energy. Well, Brazil managed to take real advantage of the, of the trade relation with China, but still with a huge potential and new opportunities that this new kind of loans uh, aim at technological uh, at the technological sector brings. So, yes, uh, Dani uh, Daniel, you have a question. Yeah, that that's very interesting, Patricia. Uh, in that direction, we have a question here from the audience, uh, correlated to technology. But before we had a question uh, from Paulo Anastasio. And he puts in, in that terms, I would like to understand a little better uh, the energy interest between uh, Brazil and China. Uh, I don't know, maybe you both. Uh, and when uh, Anasta uh, Paulo puts Brazil and China, we could uh, maybe like put it bigger, uh, Latin American and China. I can, I can speak a little bit about it. It's just because uh, China has some uh, investments in um in energy distribution in Brazil, but they are not they are not very large. Uh, what China China does is is also try to enter the 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 infrastructure for energy distribution again, selling manufactured goods, right? So I I remember being here in China and talking about one of um, an executive from uh, I don't know if it was Eletro Paulo or or somebody uh, else. And his point was very interesting um, because uh, he had two Chinese suppliers, right? Um, to in terms of of uh, uh, distribution, energy distribution, and he said that. And I told him like uh, to everybody, right? Uh, Chinese companies, what they want is to destroy the other Chinese companies. And he said, yeah, exactly. Uh, the state-owned company operates like a privately a private company, the same way that Petrobras operates sometimes, uh, and just wants to outcompete the other company. So they, the only thing that they want to know is how much the other company is charging so they can undercut the other company. That is their interest. So in other words, Paulo, the interest of the Chinese um, in the energy sector in Brazil is to make money, nothing else. And that is something that is underappreciated. Uh, because China is such a, a different place that uh, we, especially in the in the media, uh, again, you're not going to find in the media somebody telling you that state-owned companies in China uh, did a speculative attack against the People's Bank of China, which is the central bank, right? Um, Chinese companies are the most aggressive companies in the world. And every, everybody... And people who are here who has have dealt with Chinese companies will likely confirm that. Um, they can put in their chat their stories if they want. Uh, and, and that's what they want. They want to make money. And they they I don't think they have a big strategy because energy is very important for China, but it's very important for inside of China. Uh, not necessarily to control or anything like that. They want to make money. And the energy sector demands products that China is very competitive. So they want to sell to the energy sector. And mm -hmm. they want to sell more and they want to displace the Brazilian companies and they want to make money. And it's very strange because we want to put um, geopolitics sometimes when that isn't, right? Food, that is always geopolitics. Food is immensely important for China. I don't worry is immensely important for China. Anything that China buys, that has even oil production, same, Paulo. If you want to put geopolitics into this, oil production for sure. Uh, that's why, for instance, China um, has in the past lent money in exchange for future, uh, future sales of oil. I remember being in Angola and that was a discussion. And in fact, Angola signed a deal uh, with um, China selling future production of oil for a loan. But again, was at the time that China was expelling dollars from its economy. Uh, so for sure, if we're talking about the energy in terms of oil, yes. But again, it's not. There is no global supply that will guarantee 
uh, China's oil demand, if for some reason China's cut off for international markets. It, it doesn't work like this. No, oil is a, is a different commodity because it requires a constant supply. We saw that in the US uh, when uh, during the COVID, I don't know if people remember this, but in April, I think it was April, April 2020, uh, the contracts for, for oil in Oklahoma for delivery in May went to minus $40. So I don't know if you took advantage of this, but you could have not only got oil, but got $40 for getting the oil, as long as you were able to take the oil in Oklahoma. Uh, that's because the U.S. entered a lockdown and um, oil consumption dipped dramatically. Oil is a complicated asset. Uh, it's a not complicated good. Um, but that is something else. Right? Yeah, um, definitely. I yes. There, uh, th there is a, a question a little bit before here. I don't know if you want to put it together or maybe like... Um go for the, the last one first. But Vera was commenting here regarding to China becoming a technological hub. How do you see the dispute uh, in the semiconductors between China and the US? And I would I, like I, to, Zaida and Patricio, put another layer here in this the, mm -hmm. the whole discussion. How do you guys perceive like sustainability, ESG topics uh, in between Latin America and China and all this discussion together with the economy? Okay, let's let me tackle the Vera Lucia's question first, and, and I'll give it to Patricio. Uh, Vera Lucia, this is a very simple case of protectionism in which the US wants to increase the production of semiconductors uh, at home and wants to cut China off. But it's impossible to cut China off. People don't understand the level of technology that some Chinese companies have, not all of them. China still produces a lot of crap. Uh, but I visited companies here, and it's going to be impossible. Yes, the, the, the worst that the U.S. can do is delay uh, the catch-up, the technological catch-up between China and the rest of the world in terms of semiconductors. But the only thing that, it's, the, the, that the U.S. is going to do is going to make the, the Chinese governments put so much money to semiconductors that three years from now, there will be a global glut of semiconductors, maybe five years. That is what is gonna happen. It's pure protectionism on a strategic sector that is not that strategic. So really is gonna waste a lot of money in both the US and China. Now, Patricio, the ball is in your court. Great, right, Rodrigo, yes, I agree with you. This is, uh, this is protectionism and it's failing. I will add that to your, to your idea. I think this um, this dispute over the semiconductors will definitely escalate with the U.S. trying to stop, to cut off China, as you have mentioned. But it's already failing because if you see the projections of the semiconductor productions in China, it's expected, maybe the, the, the more optimistic uh, forecast, the, the, the projections indicated by 2030, maybe 35, China will be self-sufficient probably in the production of the semiconductors they need for the industry that will be even bigger, of course, in 15 years. It will be a much bigger uh, production hub of cell phones, laptops, everything that, that uses semiconductors. And did you see what happened? Uh, this was news from two months ago, I think, it was this new cell phone of Huawei, remember, that with this new microchip. And there was a discussion in the, the there was a, a special US com committee formed in the US Congress to discuss if China has stolen this technology, maybe from Samsung or from somebody else. And finally, the assessment was that China produced it uh, domestically as. China has produced many other cutting edge technology uh, that surpasses other companies, other Western companies' uh, uh, production. So 
it's still the U.S. is like astonished or or not uh, not fully aware of the reality in China of the capacities of production and producing high tech, the best high tech in the world, and that is happening, and not even the U.S. with this protectionism and these measures uh, will be able to stop it. You know, Trump failed. If Trump comes back to power now, we have to be aware that during his presidency, Trump failed. Trump increased the trade deficits. Remember, one of the, the, the goals of his China policy was to reduce the trade deficit by hurting China with the, the trade retaliations and other measures to hurt the Chinese economy. It failed. So Biden more or less tried to... Uh, find like a more stabilized situation. You know, this decoupling, I think decoupling in terms of trade is impossible. It it's not going to happen. It's a $5 billion uh, trade relation, the biggest trade relation in the history of mankind. And maybe we'll reduce a little that amount because of that, of the, given the, the different precedents we might have in the US, but that will not happen. But in the case of the technological dimension of this uh, geopolitical dispute, this will escalate. But I see that the U.S. will eventually fail anyway in this dispute. It will be impossible to, to cut off China, to stop China, because of the huge potential that people like Rodrigo, he's actually there. He knows very well. He's very well aware of this situation. And even though the difficulties that the Chinese economy is facing right now. I think that despite that, China will anyway, maybe it will be later, maybe it will not be in the 2030, 2035, maybe a little later, but China finally will, will reach the semiconductor self-sufficiency. That is my prediction, my humble prediction. <laughs> Nobody can tell you for sure, but if you analyze the, the the facts, the information that, that is what you. I think that is the the, the assessment I, I may I may reach. Thank you. And yeah, let I, me let me complement what you said. Just just one second, because I wanna I don't wanna lose this thought. Only China can stop China. Only the internal dynamics of China can stop China. There is no way that the US can stop anything. China can stop China. It's already it may be already happening, but but the US is incapable of doing that. Yeah, that, that, that that's something that brings a lot of reflection, a lot of questions. Uh, but anyway, we have a lot of interaction here at our uh, chat. Uh, let me put some more. Uh, maybe you're gonna go until like fifteen minutes more. I know maybe some people has. Another appointment now, nine in the morning in Brazil. Uh, depending on where you are, it could be a couple hours ahead or before. So uh, we have here as well, um, uh, Jasti asking a little bit about to comment on the Chinese steel intake. Uh, and we have another question as well from Danilo Andrade. Uh, a little bit more complex, but let it go. Uh, given the increasing interest of Chinese company in expanding their operations in Brazil, uh, Professor Rodrigo Zaidan was uh, commenting a little bit on that. And, consider and considering the strategic role of Singapore Exchange as a global financial hub that facilitates access. Oops, the chat just disappeared for a second for me. There we go. And consider the strategic role of Singapore Exchange as a global financial hub that facilitates access to capital for Asian companies. How can we as Brazilian as actors position ourselves to maximize synergies between these Chinese companies and the Brazilian market over uh, the next months? Okay. Um, I, I put a graph for you regarding iron ore consumption globally. Right? Okay. And I think that the chart says it all. China today is the only country that consumes iron ore. So, so uh, the fate of companies like Vali relies solely on China. There is no business. Well, 
who knows, maybe India in the future. But right now is only is only China, right? We shouldn't expect anything to change in terms of steel, right? What you have, you okay, this is iron ore. To talk about steel, is the steel industry is a mess, right? Because there is so much capacity in China. That is not even funny, right? And the problem is also that China is doing the, the energy transition and steel companies are very energy intensive. And in the past, steel companies use a lot of coal. They are now not being allowed to use coal. So the steel market is a huge mess. It will continue to be a huge mess. Sometimes China will dump steel around the world. Sometimes Chinese companies are going to be short of steel. You should expect this boom and bust cycle of steel to continue in the future, right? But I don't or no, I don't or is, is a different case, right? Uh, okay, so there is another question here. Well, what was the question? Was the, the Chinese companies expanding their operations in Brazil again? Yep. Uh, so the Chinese companies that are expanding in Brazil, they are here to make money. BYD is here to make money. BYD is here to, and why is BYD here? Because Brazil is a fresh market and they want to be here before the other Chinese companies come. So for instance, to, to, to give an idea, people don't understand this. Uh, I cannot do a poll, but think about how many Chinese car Electric car companies do you think exist? 50, five zero. Okay. There are 50 car Chinese electric vehicle companies in China, if not more. This market will consolidate. BYD wants to consolidate the market into itself, right? Because there is no way that 50 companies will maintain international scale. So right now they are they are growing because the EV market is growing, but the market will consolidate. BYD is expanding internationally. So the Chinese companies consolidate alongside the BYD and BYD starts buying or uh, engulfing these other companies, right? Uh, and that is the thing that people need to understand. Chinese companies are, are in Brazil to make money. And you need to understand the Chinese market to understand what is the position of the Chinese companies in Brazil. Very few people understand the Chinese market, right? Uh, first of all, because China is too far away. And, and I don't blame anybody. Before coming to China, I had all these preconceptions about China. Uh, China is the most aggressive, capitalist, competitive place you ever gonna be, right? So, if you want to position yourself to maximize synergies between Chinese companies and the Brazilian market, understand that Chinese companies are going there to take all the market that they can, to make as much money as they can. And yes, they will invest for the long run. It's not a big deal for them uh, to wait to make money, right? But that's what they want. The problem is that the Brazilian market, we are not used to competition in a broad sense. What do I mean by this? Every time that a, a large Brazilian company is in trouble, they knock on the government's door. Chinese companies, they want to destroy the other companies. They want to see them break, right? And they are mostly concerned with Chinese companies. But yes, if they have to outcompete Brazilian companies, they will. Uh, so yeah, that's why they are in the Brazilian market when they are in the Brazilian market. They are there to make money. Yeah, there you go. Uh, there is a lot, another like uh, question. I would say comment here that goes for the same direction, uh, from Alexandre Barros. So Alexandre, if you if you want to discuss on that, please uh, feel free to open your microphone or even post another interaction. Guys, I'm so sorry. I said nine fifteen, but in, we go until nine thirty Brazil local. Yeah, time. we go so, to nine thirty. Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. So we still have time for this. 
uh, debate. Guys, if you want to open the microphone, the, the audience, please feel free for that. We love the debate. Oh, yeah, uh, that's fine. We love that. Uh, there is a, a very interesting point here from Thiago Paiva. Is it possible China has no young labor for, for future decades? I see that young labor in China doesn't want to work because they have high degree and there are a lot underpaid jobs. That is, Thiago, you're right. That is called this laying flat movement in China. But it is, it's not as it's not what you, what you see. What you see is a caricature. And it, yes, that is this type of movement. And again, what you need to understand, Thiago, is this. For the last 40 years, China has been growing so much that everybody expected this growth to continue. And it stopped. So now uh, we have 100 million people that are going to graduate in the next few years. And yes, not everybody's going to have the job that they wanted. But that is no different than Brazil. Think about... The, the massive intake of universities in Brazil starting in the 2000s, right? All this, this, as particulares, all this, this private universities that, that existed in Brazil, all these people that got degrees, and like, oh, I got a degree to be a, a teller at a bank. In some cases, yes. This is also happening in China, but no, you're not going to be you're not going to be run out of people. What is happening in China is that China is moving towards less labor-intensive technologies. So what is going to happen is that China will need to will need fewer people like any other country. It's the same path that Japan took. People are like, oh, Japan won't have any workers. Well, that's fine. Then you move into, la into labor-saving technologies. So that is not going to happen, Thiago. I will let Patricio tackle the, the question about uh, uh, from Alexandre. I have my take on it, but I'm really curious to see Alexandre's take on, on um, oh, Patricio's take on the idea that, uh, that China sees itself as the empire of the center of the world, the Middle Kingdom. Uh, what is the point of view of the empire of the center? of China, because I have I have my take on it, but I would be curious to, to hear Patricio. Yes, uh, first of all, regarding the, the last point you, you tackle, I would say it's a mix of technology, aging population, and some, uh, a lot of jobs that were destroyed during the pandemic and the quarantine. Oh yeah, that's true. So that mix, uh, as a result, we, you have like a, 20% youth unemployment now in China, added to the fact that a lot of youth doesn't want to take these um, underpaid jobs. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cultural thing. Uh, if you take a look, if you only take a, pay attention at the economic figures, you wouldn't understand the entire picture because there, there is some kind of, uh, I think Rodrigo, uh, your point was was really good to to characterize the the situation. It's it's, it's very complex because it's not enough uh, to resolve the situation by boosting some economic sector. It will not be enough to to resolve this really complex situation, uh, which has also some cultural aspects in this Chinese youth. And well, regarding the Alexander question, China has always consider itself the Middle Kingdom. You know, Chungwo means that. That is the meaning of, of, if you buy a map in China, you will find China in the middle of the map. It's not the Western view uh, that you will find in any country in the West. So this is a millenary thing, a millenary view of the of the, of, of, of the Chinese people in general, not, not only the, the Chinese rulers. And during the all along the, the the millennia, you know, so but connecting this to Latin America, is there a new strategy? This aggressive investment strategy that we saw during the past uh, two decades. Let's bring Latin America. Let's give the America the Latin American politician huge lo huge loans. Let's build infrastructure, the big infrastructure in Latin America to have better, better access 
to agricultural products and energy. Well, that is changing. I, I, I've talked about this. I don't want to be redundant, but I, I've talked enough. And now China is somehow retreating, but not leaving the region. It's changing the perspective. Is uh, There is a revaluation of the importance, of the strategic importance of Latin America. And Latin America will continue to be important because of these raw materials. But now also because of geopolitical reasons, we are still the backyard of the US and it's important in the framework of this dispute between China and the US, Latin America is a battlefield, it's an important battlefield. But now China also wants to take advantage of Latin America as a new hub to experience this uh, new technological development, bringing companies from these electric vehicles, artificial intelligence, maybe semiconductors, still maybe too early to tell if Latin America will eventually become also a hub for production of semiconductors, we still don't know, but there's a new perspective. That, that's what I will uh, tell you, Alexander, it's a little of geopolitics, it's a little of economic priorities because of the Chinese uh, new economic situation. And of course, the dispute between the US and China is, it, it has been defining for the importance of Latin America, and it will continue to be so in the future, for sure. Thank you. Uh, we have Marcelo uh, for interaction. Please, Marcelo, feel free for that. Thank you so much, Daniel. Hi, Rodrigo. Hello, everybody. My name is Marcelo. Uh, I'm an associate professor at, uh, at uh, Fundação Dom Cabral. And Rodrigo, I think that one of the most intriguing uh, images that I've seen in the in the last years was, uh, let me share with you, if you allow me, is this one here from the Atlantic? Yeah, uh, go just for Just a it. moment. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, um, yes. Yeah, I, I think it's just amazing. And I would like to ask yeah. you, do you think that China is just retaking the place that it had before in the in the in the world uh, in the in the economics of the world so i can answer that because i love i love long-term history right so first of all let me let me clear a misconception uh when we when china says that it's the middle kingdom it doesn't say that it's china doesn't have an imperialist agenda right in the sense of of conquering conquering other lands China's project, China's project is entirely nationalistic, right? China wants to retain Chinese hood, right? And the idea of the Middle Kingdom is that we are the only civilized place in the world. So it's not that we want to conquer other countries. It's that other countries are barbaric, right? So if other countries are barbaric, we don't want their lands. You can see that what is the only what if there is a war, is there is a Chinese war, is a Chinese war with Taiwan, which China considers part of China. Right? That's it. There is no, for instance, Singapore is ruled by Chinese elites. China has no interest in taking over Singapore. Right? Uh, there is no claim to Singapore. There is no claim to Japan. There's no claim to Korea. China doesn't care about Korea, right? China cares about China. So in that sense, you need to understand China as a middle kingdom in the sense of, as Marcelo pointed out, uh, we want to retake our place as a civilized place. And civil civilization means, in, this, in, the, in the graph that Marcelo showed, it means we are as rich as the rest of the world. That's the Chinese project, right? So China, I hear this all the time. Uh, China does not want to control any of Africa. Would China like African oil or copper or whatever? Of course, they want, 
But China is not going to get involved in, in African affairs, especially because the Africans are going to take the Chinese money and tell China to get out. Right? That's 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 what you do. Like if if somebody comes and say, "Oh, here, here is here, you owe money to us." So what? We are Brazilians. How many defaults did we did we hand out to the rest of the world? We default on all of Paris banks, right? Look at Argentina. They took the they took they took the Chinese money. What can China expect in return? Nothing. That's not how this works. So in a way, China is not China doesn't have an imperialistic project, right? And it's important to understand this, right? Luis and Hickey. Uh, so let me, Paulo, let me make these two points that, that, are, that are there. Paulo says China produces 70% of the steel in the world. As I mentioned, Paulo, China has overcapacity in steel. The steel market is a mess. I'm sorry about that. If you are in the steel market, I'm sorry for you because dealing with Chinese overproduction must not be easy. Uh, Luis and Hickey, may you talk something about China, Taiwan's China's plan? Yes, I can talk about that. Nobody knows, right? Uh, but this is what I can tell about Taiwan. Up until the pandemic, or actually up until Donald Trump, I could count on ch the Chinese government to be extremely rational. The Chinese government continues to be rational, but it's not as rational as it was in the past. What do I mean by this? Very simple. Is it rational for China to attack Taiwan? Because it's irrational for China to attack Taiwan, I believe that the probability that China will attack, attack Taiwan is very, very low. In the past, I would say zero. Today, I cannot say that it's zero anymore. Does that make sense to everybody? That's... That's the, the 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 most that I can say about that. That is the only thing that I can say about China Taiwan because again, I'm now not into geopolitics and I don't know if Patricia wants to tackle this very easy question for those of us who study or come to China. Yeah, thank you. You know, um, President Xi maybe is the first president since Deng Xiaoping's era that talks a lot about Taiwan. That some say. She is obsessed about, about Taiwan, and some of his definition has been really clear. So we have to uh, pay attention to them. One of them is, for me, maybe the most important definition he has provided on the Taiwan issue is the Taiwan issue is something that must be resolved during this generation. You know, the Chinese leadership generations Usually, uh, they used to last 10 years after then. Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, but she changed that. You know, he's uh, on his third uh, period in power, and we don't know if he's going to be for the fourth or if there will be some successor after. But he was really clear about this. This is something that we cannot leave for the next generation. And if you take in consideration that the political generation lasted 10 years. So are we closer? Well, maybe. Or is he talking about generations in terms of society? We don't know. But it is clear that for Xi is a top priority. It has always been a top priority of the, of the Chinese leadership, the Taiwan, the Chinese reunification. But uh, I agree with Rodrigo. I would say, in, in other words, we are closer. I think we are closer to some development in this regard. If you if you analyze this issue from a military viewpoint, from a military perspective, you will you wouldn't find uh, a military expert saying some of them one of the side can win. It's impossible. It's a loss loss situation. Of course, it's more it's, it's highly likely that China will ultimately succeed uh, will have uh, succeed uh, invading taiwan and uh, like forcing some kind of occupation but it will be so costly in terms of human lives 
diplomatic uh, relations and material losses, of course, that it no rational mind uh, could fit that invading Taiwan might be a, a win situation of any kind. You have to consider that the US will be involved, Japan will be involved, a lot of countries will be involved. It, it could lead perfectly to a world war, this kind of a kind of situation like an an hypothetical invasion of Taiwan. But le leaving aside this military uh, viewpoint, we are closer because of Xi Jinping's priorities and because of this new situation of China in the in the global stage and the new geopolitical context with this escalating increasing tensions between the US. If you consider all, all those factors in place, definitely we are closer. I wouldn't nobody can tell when somebody something will happen, but uh, we have to pay more attention than in the past for sure. Let me First just thing. complement this by saying that I agree with everything that you said, Patricio. Absolutely perfect. It's it's weird because we're supposed to be debating and but we are mostly in agreement. Uh, my only point is that it's not clear if Xi Jinping can issue that order because this is not Russia. China is not Russia. What do I mean by this? In Russia, uh, Putin separated the political and economic powers. And this hasn't happened in mainland China. What do I mean by this? What I mean is that um, the, the, the economic interests in China of Taiwan are from the top people in the CCP, in the Communist Party. So attacking Taiwan will go against some of the top people in the Chinese Communist Party. So she would have to bypass these people, these very powerful people, economic interests. And it's not clear that he can do that. So that is also something to consider, is that even if she wants, doesn't mean that she, she can. This is not the type of dictatorship that we believe that China has. No, that is... There are some checks and balances in China, even though, of course, it is uh, 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 it is not a democracy. Deborah, you wanted to ask something. Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to make a comment to, to Alexandre, who had a, a great question. But go ahead, Deborah. Thank you. Thanks, Professor. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello, yes. everybody. Good morning. Good evening. Good morning. My name is Deborah. I am a FTC student doing specialization in business management. And thank you so much for this amazing seminar, actually. It was very special to get in touch and to learn a new vision about this times we are living here. So my question is kind of an, an option and is like a comment that the times we are seeing now. So we are talking a lot about the new opportunities. So especially Professor Patricio was mentioned to us that it's a kind of new opportunity coming to Brazil and China. And I was thinking that, um, especially for new opportunities, we are talking about agribusiness, um, iron, that is like traditional ones, maybe. But I was thinking about the new opportunity, so especially coming from the beauty market, for example. And China, it's the second one in the market globally. And Brazil, it's like occupying the fourth space during the dates. So my question uh, was like an opinion. Could please, Professor Particio, if you could share like what is the real key maybe to this new opportunities for especially for new markets that we are coming from traditional ones. So open up this this key, please. That's a good question, and I think you mentioned the beauty market. Yes. But yes. Well, you know, Rodrigo is well aware also, I think it's a booming sector. The Chinese are paying more and more attention, the Chinese women especially, to the to the beauty. So this is something really interesting, but it's also very difficult to enter these kind of markets because you must adjust to the Chinese, the Asian culture, we can say in general, and all the requirements, the special requirements. It's not only a matter of packaging. Some people think that, okay, you have to change the color of the packaging and you are into the market in China and everyone will consume your product. It's not like that, you know? There are a lot of standards, a lot of procedures, a lot of things you have to consider. So first of all, I would say, go to China, 
stay for a while, explore, invest time. And of course, this will also include investment, invest in money because it's expensive, it's far away. You have to establish, uh, it's very important to establish contact with Chinese counterparts. It's very hard to do business in China by yourself. No, no, I'm a big company, so I will open a branch in China and that will be all. It's not, it doesn't work like that. Many major companies have failed in the past because of not, underst not understanding correctly these particularities you have in the Chinese economic environment. This goes for beauty and for every other these new sectors we, we can call. But we haven't talked about, for example, renewable energy. And this was part of Lula's, Lula's agenda during his last trip to Beijing. This is really interesting for a country like Brazil, huge potential in many areas of green energy in, in, in general. So this is something I, I will pay special attention. If I were an investor in Brazil with some money, <laughs> I will I will pay a lot of attention to that. For example, I have mentioned artificial intelligence, robotics. You know, all of the, those are sectors that the Chinese companies are willing to invest, and the Chinese government is paying a lot of attention to globalize. You know, in the '90s there was this uh, opening up or this glo this going out policy. Uh, you remember, Rodrigo, this going out policy of, of Jiang Zemin, it was for these major infrastructure companies mostly, car producers and well, and uh, yeah, oil, oil producers. But now there is a going out of technological companies and not necessarily huge companies, all of them. So there is this possibility for a Brazilian uh, middle-sized maybe company to establish partnerships. There are good conditions, I think, good uh, uh, financial and, and market conditions for this kind of, uh, of new partnership. And beauty, I will consider it. Yeah, I, I will definitely say that it's a sector. It's not an easy one. I wouldn't say you're an easy, in an easy one <laughs> to enter in China. But the opportunity is there, I think, yeah. But yeah, it's, studying the market is very important. Um, just one thing, there are a couple of questions. I'm going to try to answer both very quickly because we're running out of time. There are no more bricks. Forget the bricks. I know that I'm going to, I'm going to be very pessimistic, like uh, very simple. This is the participation of the bricks in the, in the global GDP. It's in Portuguese. I hope you understand Portuguese. Uh, but if you can see it here, uh, by 2030, one third of the global GDP will be China and India. Brazil, Russia, and South Africa are going to be less than 5%. There are no BRICS. That is, that is China, then there is India, then there is all these other countries. And Alexandre, you are 100% correct. Uh, the BRICS is a geopolitical club of Chinese friends. And Brazil thinks it has a say in it. And it, it does to some extent, but not a lot. Uh, it's very important that Dilma is actually at the New Development Bank. It's very important. It's very prestigious. Uh, the, the, the Lula strip was very important to the point that, that my, the people in my compound, in my apartment complex here, they're like, oh, your president is here. It was very important. It was the first president to visit China after COVID. Uh, but there are no BRICS, right? Forget the BRICS. It is Chinese. It's a group of Chinese friends. Right, Brazil is one of them. Mateus, uh, I explained this earlier, but there is no global one. The dream of the global one is was was over after the Ch uh, People's Bank of China relented on the speculative attack of the state-owned companies in China in 2017. Today, what you have is this this uh, trade agreements in which oh, we don't use dollars, we use yuan's and reais to settle trade. It's just accounting. There is no global you want. So D1 is non convertible. You cannot buy you one. So, how can you have a global you want if you cannot buy you one outside of China and Hong Kong? That is no. Uh, and Mateus, about lower house demands? No, it's complicated. 
uh, is that demand is not increasing as it's increasing in the past. It doesn't mean that it's low. It means that it's increasing at a lower rate. That is true. And yes, it can affect iron ore prices. Yes, iron ore prices fluctuate a lot. Again, not in the long run, but in the short run, they can affect iron ore prices. And that's it. I think I answered them all. And I say and thanks, Marcelo, the for the... Yes. Thank you for oh. the, the thing for Deborah. I, I will say something about the BRICS, can I? Because yeah, it, of is course. True. Sure. it is true what you say. BRICS today is Brazil and India, and especially if you take population and GDP, no discussion about it. But it might be something else. China, China and India, not Brazil and India. China and India, sorry, sorry, China and India. But it might be something else in the future if this block continues to expand and don't diminish the role, the potential role of a country like Brazil. Please, I think Brazil could play a bigger role. You know, Brazil has already surpassed Canada as the ninth, ninth economy uh, in the world. And if there are other countries like Saudi Arabia, a major uh, oil producer, big economy of the Middle East. So if the, Indone Indonesia might join this year. So if this block continues to expand, it might be something else. But I agree today is what Rodrigo uh, says. All right. Thank you so much, Patricio. Thanks a lot, uh, Rodrigo Zaida. It was it was amazing. I was impressive with the audience. A lot of interactions, a lot of questions. Uh, Excellent questions. Yeah. yeah. Great, great question. Definitely, definitely. Uh, and for me, uh, Mateus Coutinho was the, the person of my team that was organizing that seminar together with me and together with Rodrigo from Zibs School. Uh, my feeling is, whoa, we need a second round because... There is some questions here that we didn't answer or we didn't uh, uh, talk about, but I have an idea. We have um, a playlist at YouTube uh, from FDC that we put all our, our international videos, all these international debates. It's a very interesting channel uh, and people interact uh, in that videos and, and I, I ensure that the professors get the answers. Uh, when the students and the, the colleagues interact there. So let's do that. Uh, this is my invitation. Uh, we are running out of time here. This is 9.33 in Brazil. Uh, and I would like to thank you so much, Patricio uh, and Rodrigo. It was an amazing time. Rodrigo was uh, was missing you. It's nice to see you uh, in the video. I hope to see you here in Brazil. And Patricio, you are invited to stop by Brazil in, at FDC as soon as you have Muito a possibility. Big. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we have your emails. If you if we are allowed to send you an email, you're going to receive um, a feedback with the recording of the meeting and with some interactions and, and points that uh, were uh, discussed here by email. OK, so thanks Daniel, a lot. Just one second. Please. I want to make I want to make a very simple thing, which is some advertising uh, of all the books that I've wrote. Please do uh, that. Yeah, because some of them are in Portuguese, some of them are in English. So that is Vida de Rico e Patrimonio, Modelo Dinâmico de Gestão Financeira, General Model of Working Capital Management, Economics of Global Business. And I know that I'm forgetting a couple, but buy my books. I don't get any money. Oh, that is Apelo à Razão, uh, Reconciliação com a Lógica Econômica. Let me just put it very quickly again. Yeah. Uh, and Patricia, uh, feel free if you want to share with us some um, some of your articles or books. We I can... would say some some recent papers of Latin America China relation that might be interesting to you. That maybe. would be amazing. And everything that I have written is in my website. So visit it, and you have my email. Contact me. It was a pleasure. And and great, great, great questions. Amazing. We're gonna make it available for you guys by email. We're gonna put it all together. Uh, and that's it. I'm very happy with our first edition of our global seminars. And I have the feeling that we are starting uh, uh, a community. Uh, we're going to have several debates. Please pay attention. One per month with uh, many, many schools all over the world. If I don't mind, the next one will be with a school from the UK uh, and then from Rotterdam. So a lot of discussions in this international scenario. OK, so thanks a lot and have an amazing day for everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.